for outside observers, it was a crisis that seemed to blow up out of nowhere. At the beginning of August, militants from Ethiopia's ethnic Amhara group swept into towns and cities, capturing key buildings. In the days of street battles that followed, scores of civilians were killed. By the time government forces had re-established control, some of the Amhara region's biggest cities were peppered with bullet holes. Coming just nine months after Ethiopia ended its civil war in Tigray, the burst of violence was shocking. An unexpected coda to a brutal conflict. For some of those watching, though, it was more than an isolated upheaval. Instead, it pointed to something that's been worrying analysts since 2020. The possibility that Ethiopia could collapse into a series of bloody ethnic wars. A patchwork of 11 ethno-linguistic states and two administrative regions, modern Ethiopia chugged along for decades as a multicultural success story. The fastest growing economy in the whole of Africa. But with distrust growing between its peoples, the potential is there for spectacular implosion. An implosion that could see this nation become the 21st century's Yugoslavia. Well, today, Aura Graphics, we're going to dive into the Amhara crisis and ask if it's a self contained one off or the prelude to something much bigger. When the Amhara crisis erupted in early August, it did so with an intensity that few saw coming. Over a handful of days, Farno militiamen steamrolled through the region's biggest cities. Police stations were attacked, government buildings were ransacked, airports they were seized and held for days. At its height, the uprising saw pitched gun battles between Farno and Ethiopian government forces on the streets of the regional capital, Bahir Dar. To the west, the tourist town of Lalabella, world famous for its UNESCO-protected rock churches, briefly fell to the militants. Then, as soon as it began, the crisis just seemed to blow over. The government shut down communications infrastructure, declared a state of emergency, and sent in the military. By August the 9th, the Farno had melted away from the cities they captured, returning to their rural heartlands. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed placed the whole of Amhara under the control of the security services and instituted curfews. At the time of recording, the region seems to have settled into a state best described as calm but tense. The Amara crisis, it seemed, was over. Except that might not be the whole story. While the violence does indeed seem to have abated, most of the Fano militiamen are still at large, operating openly in the countryside from where they draw their popular support. According to the BBC, during the days of the crisis, these same militiamen looted weapons and ammunition from police stations. They released thousands of ethnic Amhara inmates from prisons. On the government side, so many officials fled for the safety of Ethiopia's capital, Addis Ababa, that it's said that the federally backed state government in Amhara is in danger of imploding. More importantly, the underlying tensions that led to the violence haven't eased. If anything, the government's response may have cranked them up to 11. Under the current state of emergency, federal forces have set up roadblocks with reports that ethnic Amharas are being forbidden from traveling to Addis Ababa. In the Ethiopian capital itself, the government responded to the crisis by arresting thousands of Amharas, including at least one opposition MP. And then there's the controversial drone strike. On August the 13th, a government drone fired a missile into a crowd in Amhara region, killing at least 26. Rather than militants, though, most of the dead seem to have been civilians. Civilians from an ethnicity, Amhara, that already believes itself to be the target of discrimination by its government. <laughs> Don't have to be a highly paid analyst to see how all of this might feed the gigantic flames of resentment at the heart of this crisis. Now, we'll come on to perceptions of ethnic bias in Ethiopia in the next part of today's video. But before that, we need to briefly touch on who exactly the Fano are. Coming from an old Amharic word that you could translate as volunteer fighter, the Fano have their roots in the 1930s militiamen who fought Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, then known to the world as Abyssinia. Today, their ranks mostly comprise of farmers and unemployed young men who believe the federal government and Ethiopia's other ethnicities pose a threat to them. But there's a twist here. In the 2020 to 2022 Tigray War in northern Ethiopia, the Fano fought on the government side. Just nine months ago, they were the shock troops who helped Abiy Ahmed's forces escape a crushing defeat at the hands of the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, or TPLF. How they went from helping Abiy to taking up arms against him lies at the heart of the story that's unfolding today. So, before we get started on this section, there's a quick disclaimer. 
The modern history of Ethiopia's many ethnic rivalries is long, it is complicated, and it is way beyond our ability to do it justice in 22 minutes or so. So what follows is simply the watered down basic version. Just the important points that you really need to know in order to understand today's video. The most important of all is understanding that Ethiopia is an incredibly diverse country. With around 80 different ethno-linguistic communities, the nation is currently divided into 11 ethnically based regions plus two autonomous cities, Addis Ababa and Dardawa. Of these regions, two are extremely new. Sadaba region came into being three years ago, while the Southwest Ethiopia region hasn't even been around for 22 months. Oh, and thanks to a 2023 referendum, a new region should likewise come into being this very year. So if you're watching this in a few months, the correct number of regions is actually going to be 12. Now, the arrival of these three new regions marks a dramatic change from the past. In 1995, the Ethiopian constitution set the number at nine, a number which held for decades. It's also elevated ethnicity to being a major force in Ethiopian life. Each region doesn't just have its own government, but its own military, and often also a paramilitary force. More worryingly, each region also nurses its own set of grievances against the others. Many of these grievances are historical in nature and related to the balance of power in Ethiopia. For most of the 20th century, under Haile Selassie and then the military dictatorship known as the Derg, Amaras sat at the top of the ethnic pile. That includes during the era when the Derg deliberately exacerbated Ethiopia's horrendous famine to starve their ethnic rivals. The Derg's 1991 overthrow, however, brought major changes. With the TPLF instrumental in the Derg's downfall, they were able to elevate their own candidate to the pinnacle. Mela Zanawi was a Tigrayan who oversaw an economic boom in Ethiopia. While his administration lifted millions out of poverty, though, it also sidelined the Amhara, Somali, and the Oromo peoples. This was a bitter pill for everyone to swallow. While more than a quarter of Ethiopians are Amhara and over a third are Amoro, Tigrayans count for just 6% of the population. Nevertheless, Tigrayan leaders dominated politics from 1991 all the way to 2018 when Abiy Ahmed came to power. That's at this point that the nation's elite underwent its next great transformation. And Amoro, Abiy became prime minister at the head of a four-party coalition representing the Tigrayans, Amhara, Amoro, and the peoples of Ethiopia's south. Initially, he talked about something called Marama, a sort of vague vision of togetherness and openness. To promote unity, political prisoners were freed, exiles were welcomed back, and opposition groups were unbanned. By 2019, that unity included the absorption of almost every ethnic political party into the Prosperity Party under Abiy. Only the Tigrayans refused to join. But while Abiy talked a good game, even winning the Nobel Peace Prize for settling a long-running border dispute with neighboring Eritrea, Madama was already starting to have worrying side effects. Locked out of power, the TPLF retreated to their base in Tigray. They began refusing orders from the federal government. In Amhara, many of the newly released political prisoners joined the Fano militia now springing up across the region. Militia which felt deeply threatened by the arrival of an Amoro prime minister. During the crises of the 1980s, many Amara fled drought and famine by moving to the Oromia region. There, Amaro leaders used them as scapegoats for their own ills. By the time the Amara were deposed as the ruling ethnicity in 1991, relations had grown so poisonous that violence was all but inevitable. As The Economist notes, Amhara today believe themselves to have been the targets of an ongoing genocide ever since. Now they've certainly been the victims of ethnic violence. In 2021 alone, over 3,300 Amara were murdered, most of them in Oromia. According to the BBC, Oromia's own paramilitary force, the Oromo Liberation Army, has been, to quote, accused of widespread atrocities against Amharas. The rise of Abiy played into these fears of persecution, fears fanned by a perception that the Prime Minister was secretly trying to turn the Amoro into Ethiopia's dominant group. By late 2020, then, the political scene uh, was like a dry forest before a wildfire, just waiting for one madman to light the spark that would burn everything down. Yet when the conflagration came, it wouldn't be the Amara and the Amoro, or even the Amara and the federal government who were holding the match. No, rather, that honor would fall to the leaders of Tigray. Since we already have a video in our archive about the Tigray War titled Why the World Ignored the 21st Century's Deadliest War, we're not going to go into too much detail about it right now. The very short version is that in November of 2022, Abiy ordered the military into the Tigray region to end a political standoff. What began as a limited action quickly spiraled into a deranged carnival of bloodletting in which 
all sides committed atrocities. By the time the peace was agreed in the fall of 2022, some 600,000 people are thought to have died. But while the government would eventually win the conflict, it couldn't do so alone. At one point, Abbey's forces were so badly mauled that it briefly looked like the TPLF would march on Addis Ababa. Now, the reason the government triumphed is because it managed to bring in outside help. Outside help that's crucial for understanding the problems that Ethiopia is now facing. Outside help that consisted not just of neighboring Eritrea's military, but also Amhara's regional forces and the Fano. This last one was something of a surprise. In the run-up to the new Tigray War, the new humanitarian tracked a surge of Fano attacks on federal forces. When the conflict ignited, though, the Fano seemed to have decided to throw their lot in with the government. Partially, this may have been due to their ethnic rivalry with the Tigrayans. In the opening days of the conflict, Tigrayans hacked scores of Amara civilians to death in the town of Mai Kadra, a massacre that was answered just hours later when Fano forces slaughtered over a hundred Tigrayans. Partially, though, the decision may have been motivated by hopes for land. Western Tigray is an extremely fertile area in a wider region that's been suffering drought for years. In the course of the war, Amhara and Fano forces seized and ethnically cleansed the territory in a wave of extraordinary brutality. Human Rights Watch has documented how Tigrayan Syrians were herded into concentration camps, beaten, tortured, starved, and murdered. As we quoted the organization saying in our previous video, Amhara security forces acting under newly appointed Amhara and Wakete officers have been responsible for extrajudicial executions, rape, and other acts of sexual violence. The quote ends. Not that the atrocities were one-sided, though. When Tigrayan forces uh, later went on the offensive, they briefly swept into Amhara region. There, they destroyed hospitals, murdered civilians, and used sexual violence as an instrument of revenge. Yet for all the Amharas may have found themselves caught up in a bitter cycle of atrocity and revenge, the Tigrayans weren't the only targets of their wrath. As the war dragged on, the fabric of mutual interest trying them to the government began to tear. During the Tigrayan invasion of Amhara, locals accused Abbey's government of running away and abandoning them to their fates. But if things were bitter, as men were dying on the battlefields, the peace would be even worse. Backed by the African Union and the USA, peace talks between the government and Tigray forces took place in November of 2022 without Amhara officials present. By that, we mean there were no officials who represented the interests of the Fano or Amhara regional forces. Ethnic Amharas were indeed present, but only those who were part of the federal structure, partnered with Abbey. For the Amharas, who'd fought against the Tigrayans, it felt like they were being shut out of the peace deal. Especially when Abbey announced the issue of land seizures would be dealt with in accordance with the Constitution. For Amhara fighters, the implication was clear. Abbey would return Western Tigray, the place they'd fought and died to snatch away to the Tigrayans. Although that has yet to happen, the perception that it's just around the corner has since fueled resentment at the government as surely as, well, oxygen fuels a wildfire. Not that it's a fire the Prime Minister has made any effort to put out. In the Amora areas surrounding Addis Ababa, construction workers have been demolishing Amhara homes, ostensibly for a government building project, but in a way that looks a whole lot like it's ethnically targeted. Then, in April of this year, Abiy announced the government would disarm every single one of the 11 regional forces operating in Ethiopia. Their members would instead be integrated into federal military structures. When the announcement was made, it caused riots and protests in Amhara. But it also caused something else, an influx of thousands of seasoned fighters from the far regional forces into the Fano militias. Suddenly, these decentralized groups of farmers and unemployed young men were being joined by professional soldiers. In July, they reorganized under the banner of the Amhara Popular Front. Mere weeks later, their members were storming cities and airports in Amhara region, chasing out the government and briefly establishing control. And while they have now been forced into a retreat, no one seriously thinks that this latest crisis is over. If anything, Ethiopia's next major ethnic conflict might only just be beginning. From a purely military perspective, Prime Minister Abiy should have little to fear from the Fano. For one thing, the Ethiopian army is equipped with tanks and drones and heavy artillery, kit that the disorganized semi-amateur Fano couldn't even dream of fielding. For another, the government just won a war against a far more powerful, better-armed group, the TPLF. And comparing the Fano to the TPLF is like comparing a decent middle school sprinter to Usain Bolt at his peak. 
Unfortunately, this is where the good news ends for the government. Because what the Farno lack in equipment and training, they more than make up for in popular support. The public in Amhara region are overwhelmingly behind the rebels, and not just ordinary men and women in the streets. Per The Economist, local police and officials are often more loyal to the Farno than to the federal government. On the one hand, that means the Farno have a steady stream of angry young men ready to join their ranks. On the other, it means the citizenry can collude to make the region ungovernable. There are already signs this is happening. Since April, political leaders from Abbey's Prosperity Party have been assassinated. Killings and kidnappings have skyrocketed. So many officials have fled the area that there's fear the regional government could soon collapse. Now, it's true that the government was similarly unpopular in Tigray region, yet federal forces still managed to subdue the locals. But Amhara is different. For one thing, there's its location. Whereas Tigray lies a few hundred kilometers north of Addis Ababa, Amhara region sits uncomfortably close to the capital. Its southern extremes are just 30 kilometers from the city center. For another, there's the sheer number of people living there. While Tigray was home to 6 million before the war, Amhara region is home to over 20 million. Across Ethiopia as a whole, Amharas represent a quarter of the population. Only the Amoro number more. As one Ethiopian analyst told The Economist, fighting the Amharas is not like fighting the TPLF. Amharas are everywhere. Not only that, but they may also have some serious allies. We mentioned earlier how one participant in the Tigray War was the nation of Eritrea, which fought on Ethiopia's side despite a history of bad blood between the two. Well, plenty of Western diplomats now think Eritrea's dictator has fallen out again with Abiy and is looking to stir the pot by encouraging and backing the Farno. Remember, Eritreans and Amharas were on the same side in Tigray. It's not impossible to imagine Eritrea has maintained connections with the Farno now that the war has ended. Whether that would include backing them in a new conflict is impossible to say, but it's a scary wildcard to add to the mix, as is the potential of regional spillover. During the recent crisis, some Farno militias crossed into Aromia and attacked civilians in the town of Mendida. Others clashed along the border with militants from the Benishangul Gumas region. Just as the Tigray War saw violence sweep Amara and burst into the Afar region, the worry is that any general Fano uprising won't be contained to a single province, especially since Ethiopia's security chief, Temes Gen Turuna, has warned that the Amhara want to dismantle the whole federal system. Now, of course, we should stress that war is not inevitable. For all the boiling ethnic tensions and gathering storm clouds, an even bigger sequel to the conflict in Digray is not in anybody's interests. The trouble is, it's hard to see how Abbey can defuse the situation. Because the Farno are basically independent actors with loosely aligned goals, there's no one leadership team he could negotiate with. And while Abbey could instead try to cut a deal with political leaders in Amhara, it's hard to see what he could offer or whether anyone would listen. Yet, yeah, this isn't even the most troublesome aspect of Ethiopia's rolling crises. Back in the introduction today, we alluded to the idea of Ethiopia becoming this century's Yugoslavia, a patchwork state that collapses into bloody ethnic conflict. But Yugoslavia's demise didn't just come about because government forces fought one ethnic group or even two. It came about as the result of a complete disintegration of trust between nearly all its peoples, from Croats to Serbs to Bosniaks to Slovenes to Kosovars and so on. Ethiopia's not there yet. But there are signs that other bonds are beginning to fray, that other disasters and other crises may yet pile onto this one to cause a general collapse. A general collapse that would be felt around the entire world. While the war in Tigray and the crisis in Amhara have gotten all of the attention, they're far from the only conflicts to have roiled in Ethiopia in recent years. Even as Abiy turns his attention to suppressing the Farno, an ongoing insurgency in his home region of Oromia has been destabilizing the government and deepening ethnic tensions. Led since 2018 by the Oromo Liberation Army, or OLA, this insurgency is technically supposed to be about freeing the Oromo from domination by groups like the Amharas and the Tigrayans. We say, technically, because what it really seems to be doing is engaging in a clandestine campaign of ethnic cleansing. In the last few years, over half a million Amharas have fled Oromia, while thousands have been murdered. Perhaps more worrying, the spectre of Amoro paramilitaries burning their villages and killing their compatriots has driven more and more Amharas into the arms of the Farno. It's not for nothing 
that some Farno militias launched attacks into Aromia during the August Crisis. In some ways, this is darkly reminiscent of the run-up to Yugoslavia's collapse. The ugly way, the growing fear of other ethnicities drove even former moderates into the arms of the extremists. The way the actions of these extremists then created a feedback loop, pushing everyone even further apart. But to be fair to Abbey's government, they've tried to end this insurgency. In April this year, the two sides met for peace talks, but the OLA flatly rejected the government's demands. Not that the OLA are Abbey's only headache right now. Up in the north of Tigray, the war may be over, but its catastrophic after-effects are still lingering. For civilians, the most catastrophic of these is doubtless the ongoing food insecurity. In April of this year, the UN and the US abruptly suspended food aid to the region when it came to light that the Ethiopian government and military were colluding to steal and sell it at a markup. According to The Guardian, to quote, aid workers briefed on the initial findings of the US aid investigation say the agency believes this could be the biggest ever theft of humanitarian food and that the Ethiopian government officials are deeply involved. End quote. The side effect of halting aid, though, has been a return of starvation. During the Tigray War, the government blockaded the region while Farno militias burned crops, leading to a famine that killed hundreds of thousands. Well, now death from hunger is slowly returning to Tigray. The BBC reports at least 1,400 starved to death after the aid was suspended, although thankfully it's now been reinstated. From a military perspective, though, it's not the starvation that's the major problem in Tigray, but the continued presence of Eritrean soldiers. Having fought on Abbey's side, Eritrea's forces were supposed to leave Tigray under the peace deal, but they're still there. They're occupying towns near the border, looting villages in the Arab district, even forcibly recruiting Arab men into the Eritrean army. In short, Tigray remains unstable, with an occupying force on parts of its soil, one that committed crimes against humanity and may now be trying to stir up the Fano against Ethiopia's government. Yet perhaps the most dangerous development in Ethiopia isn't the rise of ethnic militias or the presence of Eritrean troops. Instead, it might be the one thing that is guaranteed to scramble politics everywhere. And that's a collapse in living standards. Between 2010 and 2019, Ethiopia was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. At a time when the US was chugging along with an average growth of 2% a year, Ethiopia was averaging an eye-watering 9.5%. Across the country, poverty was plummeting. While in 1995, nearly two-thirds of Ethiopians lived in poverty, by 2015, it was closer to a quarter. When people looked to the future, they felt certain that it was going to be brighter than ever. So you can imagine the shock many feel now, arriving in a future that is less shining bright and more miserably dark. Today, the inflation in Ethiopia is over 30%. Staple goods are becoming unaffordable for many. Rates of poverty are increasing in all regions and shooting up in those affected by war or insurgency. In divided societies, economic woes tend to act as accelerants. One part of Yugoslavia's collapse that is rarely remarked on these days is how the economy went kaput at the dawn of the 1990s. As conditions worsened, local government and media divided along ethnic lines and began blaming the other groups for ordinary people's woes, adding oxygen to already smoldering resentments. Of course, Yugoslavia's economic collapse was near total, eventually spiraling into hyperinflation after the war started. Ethiopia is nowhere close to that yet. Still, we can see faint warning signs that Africa's second most populous nation may be headed for trouble. And if that happens, it'll be a nightmare for us all. Unlike the Tigrayan Rebellion, a generalized Fano uprising is not something Abi could easily contain. As Adisu Lashitu of the Brookings Institute told the Japan Times, quote, Abi's government is unlikely to survive a sustained mass uprising in the Amhara region, especially given the mounting political and economic crisis around the country. End quote. And while it's worth taking a moment here to remember that Abby is a war criminal who helped engineer a blockade of Tigray that starved hundreds of thousands to death, it's also worth noting that we should all fear a complete collapse of Ethiopia's government. Right now, parts of Africa are going through massive upheavals. Sudan has collapsed into a civil war. West Africa is being rocked by military coups like the recent one in Niger. The Central African Republic is turning into a playground for Wagner mercenaries. In recent history, Ethiopia has acted both as a counterweight to lawlessness and a stable security partner for the West. If it gets sucked into another Tigray-style ethnic conflict, the whole region could be disrupted with implications for everybody. So as we end the video today, it's with hope that we're wrong. 
that we've misread this situation and the Farno will come to a deal with the government, or that a conflict is going to somehow be averted. Because if we're right, then there could be dark times ahead, not just for Ethiopia, but for the whole of East Africa, if not the world.